married. Oh, there we go. Somebody got in. Uh, long before she married Henry, um, we have to talk about her first husband. So, as I said, Eleanor's father died in 1137. And she became a very, very wealthy heiress. Um, she, the, if I can go back a little bit, just to show you again that um, this ma this massive amount of land she had here, um, these were all salt pans through here. So this was very um, attractive. Um, Bordeaux was rich for its wine, the same way it is today. Um, Bordeaux was also a major trading port along with La Rochelle. So this made Eleanor a very attractive prospect. And shortly after her father died, um, she ended up marrying the son of Louis VI, um, the King of the Franks. His name was actually Louis VII. He was a co-regent with his father. He had already been crowned a co-king with his father. So they married shortly thereafter. Um, and then less than a week after they married, after Louis and Eleanor married, and that's what you're seeing on this image here is the two of them being married, um, Louis VI died, which made Louis VII the sole king of the Franks, and it made Eleanor queen of France. So she went from being basically, again, between the ages of 13, 14, 15, she went from being an orphan uh, when her father died, to being this wealthy heiress, to suddenly being married, and then being the Queen of France. So that's a lot for a teenager to take on in a very kind of short space of time. So what was life with Louis like? Well, first of all, there are two conflicting accounts of how this marriage even came to be. Um, one account says that it was Louis VI who actually brokered the marriage with his son. And that's the account that I tend to agree with, because again, as we saw on that map, Louis didn't have a whole lot of land holdings himself. So here is this wealthy young heiress, too young to really run the Aquitaine on her own. There are already some rebellious uh, noblemen fighting over this land. So Louis, you know, decides to scoop her in, marry her to his son, and he then gains control of all of this land. The other um, theory is that Eleanor's father was already brokering a marriage with Louis VII uh, before he died. I, I, I kind of doubt that because, again, her father wasn't that old when he died. He died unexpectedly, and um, every chance was he was going to find another wife and, and get himself a male heir. So that doesn't seem that likely. On the other hand, you know, you did make advantageous marriages for your daughters. So hard to say for sure. But in any event, what we know is all marriages of this time, when you're talking about nobility and you're talking about royalty, these were arranged by people in power for political or financial reasons. They weren't love matches. Now, when we get to Eleanor's life in England much later, as I said, there are court records. We have more evidence of what her life at court was like then. But her life with Louis um, at the court was, we, we've got a lot less about that. So what do we know about them? Well, they were both teenagers. We think he was maybe two or three years older than her, again, depending on when she was born. Um, so they were close in age. They stayed married for 15 years um, until their marriage was annulled. They had two daughters. Uh, the first one wasn't born until eight years after they were married. Um, the second one was only a few years before their annulment. Uh, and we both, and we know that they both took part in the Second Crusade, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the drama kind of surrounding Eleanor. At Anne, this... I can't hear you, Deb. You can't hear me, Deb. I can't hear you. You can't. Uh oh. No, not for a, a little bit now. Anyone else? Is anyone else having problems? Deb, this is Betsy. I can hear you fine. Yeah, no, I, I can. can. Okay. No. Okay. Let Absolutely. me lean a little closer to the screen then. Sorry about that. Here, let me go back to share from current. Okay. I'll try to speak up a little louder and lean a little closer. So what I was saying was um, the, the kind of image of, of Eleanor at this time that she was married to Louis. And again, we don't have a lot of contemporary evidence for this, just chroniclers writing actually somewhat later. But a lot of them said she was willful, she was frivolous, she was flirtatious. Um, another popular image of her at this time was that she exerted a lot of power over Louis. 
Louis was a very pious man. In fact, Eleanor was supposedly, uh, she supposedly said he was more monk than king. Um, we know she had a strong personality. We know she was very vibrant and intelligent. Louis was a little quieter, supposedly absolutely besotted with Eleanor. She not so much with him. But we really don't have evidence that she had that much control, if any, really, over uh, Louis's court. And, and some of this comes from, this speculation comes from the fact that later, when we do get to England, we will see that Eleanor did exert um, a fair amount of power uh, once she was in England. But, um, and so some historians say, well, she must have then been, she was the stronger personality, Louis was very meek and mild, obviously, you know, and they put all the blame on Eleanor. If he had a disastrous battle, well, it was Eleanor that pushed him into doing this. There's really no evidence of that. In fact, we know um, surviving from Louis's court, there are 20 charters um, that survive from his court that are in Eleanor's name. But 17 of those relate to the Aquitaine, which was still her property. Uh, she was still the Duchess of Aquitaine. But even of those 17, it looks like only a few actually she was directly involved with because the minute she married Louis, he became the Duke of Aquitaine and he started setting up his own government there. So actually there's evidence to the contrary that she actually lost, not that she had much control to begin with because she was so young uh, and she married Louis almost immediately, but that he was actually gaining some of the control over the Aquitaine. So we really don't have any evidence uh, of this, you know, to support this rumor that, oh, she bulldozed over Louis and, you know, she took control of the court and she pushed him into these disastrous battles and things. We, we have no, no proof of that. But we do know that from 1147 to 1149, um, Eleanor did accompany Louis on the second crusade. Uh, this was to um, protect um, Jerusalem and the Holy Land from Turkish assault. I don't have time to go into the crusades in detail here, but basically they were a series of religious wars between Christians and Muslims, both trying to secure uh, sacred sites, what we now think of as in the Middle East, um, for, for themselves. And depending on how you count it, there were eight or nine major crusades and then some minor ones. And some were more successful than others, uh, depending on what side you were on. Some were larger than others. But we do know that in 1144, uh, the Christian state of Edessa fell to Muslim forces. And the, the um, um, Pope at the time, um, Pope Eugenius III, he called, a, uh, he put out a call for a second crusade to go and, and try to save these lands. And this was a little unusual compared to the first one, because in this case, this was the first time you actually had two kings kind of heading up the crusade. So in the picture here, you've got Louis VII of France and his contemporary from Germany, Conrad III. They were leading the crusades forward. And Eleanor came with Louis. Um, and she brought some of her ladies in waitings with her. Her, her. her ladies of the court came along with her. Um, and as we're going to see, the reason I mentioned the Second Crusade is because there were a lot of rumors that came out about Eleanor during this crusade in particular. And again, they still carry on almost to this date. Um, people are still talking about these rumors that surrounded her during the Second Crusade. Thanks, Cheryl. So... One long since the debunked rumor or myth that I'm, comes up. Um, I'm laughing because. Oops. Um, can you can you mute Leslie? Thank you. Um, one long since um, debunked myth that has come up surrounding Eleanor is this story that she brought 300 of her ladies in waiting with her on this crusade. That she dressed them as Amazons, um, and they went. They were scandalous. It was scandalous. Now, in The Lion in Winter, that, that still I showed you a minute ago from that film, in the film, Eleanor says, I even made poor Louis take me on crusade. How's that for blasphemy? I dressed my maids as Amazons, and I rode bare-breasted halfway to Damascus. Louis had a seizure, and I damn near died of windburn. But the troops were dazzled. Great writing, fantastic line, no evidence it ever happened. Um, she did take some ladies in waiting with her 
Whether they dressed as Amazons, we don't know. Certainly, I don't think anybody was running around bare-breasted. Uh, but this image is kind of interesting. So I'm sharing this image with you because this is from a 19th century book called Heroines of the Crusade. And it shows Eleanor and her ladies. Um, obviously, because it's Victorian, they're very properly dressed. You're not seeing any bare-breasted Amazons here. But the, the reason I'm showing it is I had to laugh at this because if you look closely, um, it's, from a, it's from a website called pixels.com. And if you look, you can see these little hash marks um, on, the, on the image. And that is because if you go to pixels.com for $62, you can buy yourself this lovely yoga mat that you see here on the right of Eleanor of Aquitaine and her ladies during the crusade. So if you wanna practice your yoga moves with Eleanor, uh, you, can, you can do that. But anyway, that myth is, is debunked. No proof of that, nobody writing at the time about that. Another rumor, uh, well, I should say also before we get to the next rumor, the crusade was actually a disaster for Louis. It did, did not turn out well. Uh, the, the Turks decimated his army in Asia Minor. Uh, at one point, they reached the court of Raymond, um, Eleanor's uncle, actually, Raymond, who was the Prince of Antioch. And at this time, there was real conflict. And you can see in this image here, this is Louis on the right with his crown and his, his um, robe. And this is Raymond paying homage to Louis. So they arrive at the court of Raymond of Antioch, who is Eleanor's uncle. And Louis says, you know something? I, I actually don't care about the original charge for this crusade of going to Edessa. I wanna go straight to the Holy Land. I wanna go straight to Jerusalem and take the battle there. And Raymond said, I really don't think that's a good idea. Um, I don't think you should be doing that. So they kind of clashed. And as a result of that, Eleanor actually sided with her uncle, Raymond. And what came out of that was uh, Louis got very upset, very jealous. It got to the point where, where Eleanor said, I'm not even going with you. I'm not even going to go to Jerusalem with you. I'm staying here in Antioch with Raymond. We do know from chronicles, uh, chroniclers of that time period that she was pretty closeted with Raymond. They were having a lot of discussions. Now, whether this was family catching up, whether they were talking politics because she was siding um, with Raymond's strategy, or whether they were having an affair, which is the rumor that came out of all of this, uh, we really don't know for sure. But the big rumor that came out was Eleanor slept with her uncle. She, she, was, she was having an affair with her uncle and this enraged Louis. And in fact, when Eleanor said, I'm not leaving Antioch, I'm staying here, you can, you can continue on to Jerusalem, he forced her finally to accompany him. But we do know we've got one chronicler, um, John of Salisbury, and I'm just going to read what he said. He said, Eleanor was engaging in a pattern of misconduct, a form of deliberate provocation, a will to manifest her independence. Uh, the clerics interpreted this, who were writing about this at the time, interpreted this as infidelity, whether or not it amounted to outright adultery. For the queen's clerical critics, her conduct failed to conform to the church's standard for the proper self-effacing role of a wife or a queen, and she acted as a man, even a king. So Louis wasn't happy about this, um, and, and obviously um, the chronicler is writing about it. I should say those chroniclers saying that she had this affair, they were writing 30 years after the fact. They were writing at a time when Eleanor was married to Henry II when she was imprisoned by Henry II, as we'll get to later, um, and when for a short time, Henry was trying to convince the Pope to let him divorce Eleanor, which didn't happen. Um, so again, as with, if you came to the Anne Boleyn talk, we have to be careful when we read some of these sources, we have to consider when they were written, who was writing them, um, who was, if you will, sponsoring the writing of them. In this case, it definitely sounds like Henry was sponsoring the writing of them. But what we do know is Louis wasn't happy, obviously, with Eleanor pushing back on all of this and taking a, taking a stance about this and siding with her uncle. And although Eleanor and Louis already were having some marital issues, um, they were very different personalities, after all, um, the, the Crusades really began the, the kind of the end of their marriage. So a couple of more rumors um, that came out of the Crusades. Uh, the guy on the left here is Geoffrey of Anjou. 
He's actually was actually the father of Henry II, Eleanor's future husband. There was a rumor she slept with Geoffrey. Eleanor was a busy woman, if you believe all these rumors. There was a rumor she slept with Geoffrey. Uh, one rumor was she slept with him on crusade. Geoffrey wasn't on crusade, but she had met him and she had met his son, Henry, uh, in France. Um, so there was a rumor that she had had an affair with Geoffrey of Anjou. Again, straight from when Henry was trying to possibly divorce Eleanor. 30 years after the fact, um, you know, this supposedly happened. This is the first time we hear of it was after that. And then the more ludicrous, the most ludicrous rumor that came out of the Crusades was that Eleanor had an affair with Saladin, uh, the person you see here on the right, he became the, the very famous Muslim warlord. Um, the reason this one is ludicrous is because Saladin was 10 years old at the time. So even if Eleanor was sexually promiscuous, uh, first of all, Saladin was no place near where Eleanor was on the Second Crusade. Secondly, I very much doubt she was having an affair with a 10-year-old. But this is how these rumors kind of continue to, to bubble up. People still talk about them. So on the way home, uh, the, the Crusade was a disaster. Um, Eleanor and Louis are heading back to Europe and they stop off to visit the Pope who had called for this crusade. And by now the rumors and the word had spread, Eleanor and Louis were not getting along. Uh, so the Pope tried to play peacemaker and he even gave them a sumptuous bed with beautiful coverings on it. And he said, go do your duty. You know, you're married. Um, I want you to be together, um, do what you're supposed to do. And they did, um, but it was a very, it was a very short reconciliation. Um, that is when their second daughter was conceived. Um, so they did have a, a second daughter, but by March of 1152, their marriage was annulled. The official reason that was given was because they were too closely related by blood. Uh, but this was nonsense. They were, in, in modern terms, they were, I think, um, it was a third cousins once removed. I think that's what we would consider them today. But that was nonsense because that relationship had been known for quite some time. And in fact, the Pope had said, that's no problem. You can get married anyway. So probably the real reason, one of the main reasons was Louis needed a son, right? Um, we still think of, we can't have women rulers. It has to be men rulers. Eleanor had only given him two daughters um, and over 15 years of marriage. Like I said, the first one was not born until eight years after they were married. So he, he definitely wanted a son. They weren't getting along anyway. After the marriage was annulled, he married two more times. His second wife um, only gave him a daughter and died in childbirth. He married again um, a few years later and finally got the son that he wanted. So it's probably more likely that it certainly had nothing to do with the blood relationship. But very shortly after her annulment, Eleanor needed another husband. She, um, she supposedly wrote to um, Henry Plantagenet, who was at that time the Duke, I'm sorry, the Count of Anjou and the Duke of Normandy, um, very powerful man in his own right. He was the grandson of Henry I of England. And she wrote to him saying, hey, come, you know, let's get together, come marry me. That was one story. Again, we don't have any contemporary um, documents to really back that up, but that's what we're told. Um, it could also be that Henry turned his eye to Eleanor because, again, this would expand his kingdom even more, his holdings even more. He had quite a bit of land in France, but uh, this would expand it even further. And again, she was still a very attractive catch at this age. Now, there was a big age gap between Eleanor and Henry. Uh, Eleanor, by this time, was anywhere between 28 and 30 years old. Henry was about 19 years old when they got married. Um, so again, was it a love match? Was it arranged marriage? Um, there weren't a whole lot of love matches back then. Uh, they were together a long time. They did have a lot of children, uh, but we don't, we don't really know for sure. But we do know that with her marriage to Henry, Louis lost any control over the um, Aquitaine and Henry now became the Duke of Aquitaine. Henry also was recognized as the future King of England. And again, I don't have time to go into all the the background about this, but basically, as I said, he was the grandson of Henry I. His mother was Henry I's daughter, Matilda. And in fact, when Henry I died, um, his, his son had died, his, his eldest son had died, 
And he named his daughter Matilda as his successor. He said, I want Matilda to succeed me. But the minute he died, um, his nephew came running over from France to grab the crown himself. His name was Stephen. And Matilda and Stephen had a long protracted, there was a big civil war that went on for close to 20 years, I believe, called the Anarchy. It was dubbed the Anarchy, where the two of them were duking it out over who was going to um, control the throne of England. Finally, it was Stephen. Stephen won out. Matilda went back to France. But in the end of the day, um, Stephen not having, well, he did actually have two male heirs, but he decided to name Henry his heir instead um, because Henry kept coming over and invading. <laughs> so they made a peace deal and he said, okay, you can be my heir. Um, I'll adopt you as my son and my heir. And that's how Henry ended up becoming King of England. So Although Eleanor only had two daughters with Louis, and everyone, everyone always blames the, you know, the woman for not giving sons, um, with Henry, she had quite a few children, um, five sons and three daughters. And you can see in this image here, this little drawing here, this is Henry up here. This is all of his children with Eleanor. So they had William. Um, he died when he was only three years old, unfortunately, but that was their first son. Henry, young Henry, who ended up becoming Henry the Young King, who we will talk about later. Richard, who you may know as Richard the Lionheart. And then Geoffrey. And then the last son, um, John, who became King John. And then they also had three daughters. So um, basically, Eleanor, um, I, I said, I, I believe in the description, I say that Eleanor was actually um, the mother of two monarchs. Uh, wife of two monarchs, mother of two monarchs. But in reality, as we'll see, um, as I said, young Henry was made co-king with his father for a short time. And certainly Richard and John went on to be kings as well. So um, Eleanor made very advantageous marriages for her children, as was the way um, her three daughters, uh, Matilda, Eleanor, and Joan, who you can see in these three images here. They married either nobility or royalty. Um, so they made very good marriages, as did most of her sons. Now, her, her relationship with her sons could be problematic. We see this in The Lion in Winter. This has been recorded in history. But there is evidence that they did hold her in affection. Uh, Henry the Young King, on his deathbed, um, he pleaded for his mother's case while she was imprisoned by his father. Uh, Richard I, as we're going to see later, that's where she really gained a lot of political power when Richard was king. Um, and Geoffrey and John, even though her relationships with them were not maybe quite as good, they named daughters after her. And John actually saved her from a siege um, that we'll talk about later, uh, late in her life. So there is evidence that there was fondness between Eleanor and her children. So what was Eleanor's role in the court of Henry II? As I said, we know that she didn't have as much power as some people ascribed to her uh, in the French court, but what about in Henry's court? Well, Henry was a very different beast from Louis. As I said, he was the grandson of, of Henry I of England. His mother was the Empress Matilda, and she was a feisty character in her own right. And even as a young man, he had a very powerful, strong personality. He exerted a natural authority and decisiveness. Uh, and in strength of personality, in that sense, Eleanor and Henry were very, very well matched. But we also know that people that are, have the same personality can sometimes clash as well. But even though Henry was more decisive, more authoritative, more he was much more a formidable ruler than, than Louis VII, he did allow Eleanor to have power in a way she didn't have in Louis's court. So that's kind of interesting. He really didn't, particularly in about the first 10, 15 years of their marriage, he really made very little attempt to impose any authority over Aquitaine. He already had a bunch of holdings. He couldn't be everywhere at once. So initially he really did um, leave the Aquitaine alone. And in fact, he spent most of his time, of his time as king, I believe he only spent about 13 years in England. So he was on the continent a lot, seeing to his territories over what is now France. 
And because of that, he left Eleanor in charge a lot. Eleanor ruled as his regent a lot of the time that he was in France while he was concerning himself with other matters. And despite the fact, as we see, she was frequently pregnant for the first 15 years of their marriage, she played a very active role in their government and in the administration. We've got good documentary evidence of that. Uh, we see that she, uh, and at the same time, she was still managing her own domains in, um, in Aquitaine. Um, and there are, there are records proving that twice she got, uh, she got involved with land disputes, with clerical disputes when she was acting as Henry's regent. So wielding a lot of power in a way that she was not able to do when she was married to Louis. In around 1167, um, Henry established um, Eleanor in Poitiers um, and, and said, okay, go rule Aquitaine, um, take Richard with you, his, his favored son, Richard. Um, he said, take Richard with you. Um, I'm gonna give Richard, I'm gonna deem him the Aquitaine you know, after you, so take him with you. But by now, relationships between Eleanor and Henry were actually getting strained. Henry um, had a lot of infidelities, let's put it that way. Um, and, and so the feeling was at this point that he just wanted Eleanor kind of out of the way. So he goes, okay, go take care of Aquitaine, take Richard with you. Richard was only about 10 years old at the time. So again, it was Eleanor who was really ruling this area. So although she was given a lot of control initially, in her marriage um, and a lot of autonomy. As we see later on, uh, when, when their relationship started breaking down, Henry actually started gradually whittling down the powers that Eleanor had been holding on to, um, to such an extent that finally she couldn't even issue her own um, charters uh, in Aquitaine. He, he really cut her power. Now this all changed again after Henry died. When Richard becomes king, um, Eleanor regained a lot of her power but not uh, in the later years of, of her marriage to- Hello, please leave a message after the tone. Um, okay, so- uh, Nancy Cole, oh, um, I- Somebody please mute your mic. I dropped off something that was yours in our mailbox, so I walked it down, I did want to- Okay, finish. sorry about that. I'm gonna to try to talk over that message anyway, on the phone because I can't mute anybody else. Uh, um, from the Ulysses uh, library. Can Leslie un uh, mute them? Uh, Leslie, are you still here? I think she doesn't stay on, unfortunately. You know, if you anyway. can hear me, can you please mute your microphone, whoever has the answering machine on? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I mentioned, I mentioned that Eleanor ended up in prison. Well, this is how this happened. There was a revolt between 1173 and 1174. This was led by the sons of Eleanor and Henry. And this really put an end to Eleanor's influence uh, at the English court, at least during Henry's reign. The, the revolt was led by their eldest son, young Henry. I mentioned young Henry, but it was also assisted by his brothers, Richard and Geoffrey. Uh, it was backed by the kings of France and Scotland, who were fighting with Henry II at this time, and actually even many barons from England and Normandy. Um, they they actually also backed this because they were saying, "Ah, eh, Henry II is getting old. These young kids are the future. Let's hedge our bets and say the, these guys are the future." So how did this happen? Well, what happened was a few years before that, in 1169, Henry II decided. I am going to split up my domains and my titles, and I'm gonna start sharing those with my sons. Um, so he said, okay, young Henry, you're my eldest son now because William has died. You're going to receive England and Normandy and the Anjou. Richard, my second son, you're gonna get your mother's Duchy of Aquitaine. Um, um, Jeffrey got some stuff. John was still too young. John was almost more or less uh, a toddler at this point. And then the following year in 1170, Henry decided he was gonna crown his eldest son, uh, young Henry, as a co-regent with himself. This was not unusual. This actually happened a lot in France. If you recall, I said that Henry, the, or, uh, sorry, Louis VII was actually co-regent with his father, Louis VI. So this wasn't that unusual. And Henry did this because he said, I don't want any disputes. I saw what happened in the anarchy between my mother and my uncle, Stephen. And I want it to be very clear 
who my successor is. So I'm just going to name him now and be done with it. The problem was he did not give young Henry any power. And young Henry being, he was about 16 years old at the time, I think, 15, 16. And he was a typical teenager. <laughs> so instead of being grateful that, whoa, I'm co-regent, he's like, hey, you know, where's my land? Where's my power? He started living like a king. He started living lavishly, but he wasn't getting the money he needed. Um, he, was, he was rapidly going into debt and he was annoyed that he wasn't, you know, getting recognized or getting power as he thought he should be. In addition to that, a couple of years later, um, Henry II was trying to broker a marriage arrangement with his then six-year-old son, his youngest son, John. John had no land at this point. In fact, his nickname was John Lacked Land, Lack Land, because he had no holdings. And so Henry said, oh, I've got to, you know, to sweeten the pot for this marriage arrangement, um, I've got to give John some land. I've got to give John some castles. So he started taking castles away. He took some from Geoffrey. Um, Henry, young Henry got upset and said, no, 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 this, that rightly, this should be mine. So this started this whole revolt where the sons got together and decided to push back against their father. Again, Eleanor was um, blamed for being the instigator behind all of this, but there's a lack of evidence to say she instigated it. We know she was involved with it, but we don't know that she instigated it. There's no, there's no proof of that. We know she didn't rush to Henry's side when the revolt started. And in fact, Richard and Geoffrey, the two sons who joined, the two brothers who joined um, young Henry, they were only 15 and 14 at the time themselves. So they were still under Eleanor's custody, um, but she sent them on their way. We know that she militarily, she sent military aid. She made sure that her sons escaped um, away from, from any harm from their father. So we do know that undoubtedly she did join the revolt, um, but we don't know that she actually was the person who started the revolt or led the revolt. You know, rumor said, well, she was annoyed. At, she did this because she was very annoyed because Henry was having affairs. That seems highly unlikely to me. However, um, we do know that, you know, her powers had been diminished by Henry. So she may have been upset about that. She may have been upset about the way she saw her sons being, what she thought was unfairly treated. Who knows? Maybe she was upset that her husband was having affairs. But I, I would put my money on the fact that she probably was not happy by the fact that her powers were being diminished. And by this time, I should also say young Henry, the co-king, he was married to Louis VII's daughter. So Louis VII was still you know, king over in France, Eleanor's ex-husband. Uh, ex um, he had had a daughter by his second wife. Um, so um, Henry was married to this woman. And so Henry's father-in-law, the King of France, was pushing this, you know, he was he was saying, yeah, yeah, go revolt against your father because the two of them were enemies. And it's like, why not cause some chaos in the enemy camp? So it seems more likely that it was probably the King of France who really helped helped this kind of push forward. In any event, Henry won out. He, he ultimately prevailed. Um, and by early 1174, Eleanor was captured. Um, she was trying to escape to France to seek refuge in her ex-husband's court, as it happens. Uh, but she was captured and imprisoned. Henry forgave his sons, interestingly enough. He forgave his sons. He pardoned them. He gave them back territories that they had lost during the revolt. Um, and he had kind of a fragile peace with them until around the early 1180s, but he never forgave Eleanor. So Eleanor was put under what we would now probably think of as house arrest. We know, and this is one of the places she was imprisoned, Old Sarum in uh, Wiltshire. This is the, the ruins of the remains. She was moved around a few times. Um, we know that um, he, he never forgave her. Initially, the early pipe rolls, the kind of records of the courts, tell us that she only had one or two servants and very little resources in terms of monies coming in. Um, we were also told that young Henry, as I mentioned before, on his deathbed interceded for his mother and said she needs to be treated better. Uh, we do know that other later records show that she was treated very, very well. She never lived in a prison. She always lived in a palace, even when she didn't have many servants or money. Um, she lived quite well in a, in a palace. She lived like a queen. And, and later records show us that she was given very sumptuous garments, um, that she had a lot of money spent on her for food. 
that she did get to meet with her daughter and son-in-law when they visited England, that she was attending some functions, um, and that, in fact, Henry did bring her out every now and then to attend um, important court functions as well. But she remained in prison. In fact, Henry, even while he was still fighting with his sons when they started rebelling again um, in, the, in the early 1180s, um, he even sent to, said to Richard, I'm giving back what I, you know, what I gave to you, I'm giving back to your mother. But it didn't really mean anything because Eleanor, it really was just giving it back to Henry as Eleanor's husband, because Eleanor was imprisoned. She had no autonomy. She, it must've been a very, very, very frustrating time for her uh, because she had no control over anything at this point. She was politically impotent. So she must've been very, very frustrated. The family feuds never did really resolve. Um, in 1182, another little conflict broke out and war. Um, during this time, young King Henry died. He died of an illness. So then Richard became the heir to the throne. And the final years of Edward, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, Henry II's reign were really uh, marred by disputes with his sons. And he ended up dying. Uh, Henry died only at the age of 46 in 1189. But this did change Eleanor's fortunes. So Eleanor's latter years. The last 15 years of Eleanor's life, um, between the time her son Richard became king in 1189 and the time she died in 1204, were probably her most active ones and her most politically significant ones. She wielded a lot of political influence. She returned to government under Richard. Um, she had control of some political affairs. She ensured that both Richard and John's successions went through. These were never a done deal uh, in, in this time period. There are always people vying to take the crown over. So she made sure their successions went through smoothly. Um, she undertook a lot of important diplomatic missions traveling abroad. Um, she held off rebellions and sieges. And as I said, she even reigned again as regent under Richard for some time. And you've got to, you know, again, look at these dates. I mean, by the time Richard becomes king, well, the first thing he does is he releases Eleanor. He restores all of the lands and control over everything she had lost. But by this time, by the time Richard becomes king, she's about, we think she's about 67 years old. So she's not young. Um, and by the time Richard dies and John becomes king, she's 77 years old. And she was very, very, very energetic. And again, this is a time period, most of her immediate family circle, particularly the men, they're dead. I mean, Louis died when he was about 60 years old. Um, we know, as I said, Henry died when he was, what, 46, 47. Um, her, her, her own sons, you know, um, Henry the Young King died young. Geoffrey died young. Richard, King Richard here, he doesn't make it to age 40. King John later, he doesn't make it to even quite to age 50. So, and her own father died when he was, I believe, 39. So Eleanor was, was really remarkable to have such a long life and have so much energy. So the minute that Richard becomes king, he gives Eleanor control over some of the English kingdoms or some of the English uh, territories. So she went out and she was visiting, they said, city to city and castle to castle. And she was holding what they called queenly courts. And she was releasing prisoners. She was getting oaths from, from free men to say, you know, you have to swear an oath to my son who had not yet been crowned king. Um, and so she traveled not only throughout all of England at this age, she also traveled extensively, as I said, on diplomatic missions. And she went to Italy and Germany. She crossed the Alps more than once. And this was, you know, we didn't have frequent flyer points then. <laughs> I mean, traveling then was a big deal for anybody. And when Richard goes on crusade uh, in 1190, when he goes on crusade, she becomes regent of England while he's on crusade. Now, when Richard was returning from the crusades in 1192, he was captured by Leopold V, uh, who was the Duke of Austria. Uh, Leopold um, ultimately sold, um, sold Richard as a captive to Henry VI, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. There were bad blood between these three men. Um, this was a great way to make some money, hold somebody very, you know, um, powerful captive, and you can get some really good ransom for this. Eleanor managed not only to keep 
England intact during this period when her son was imprisoned. She worked tirelessly with his counselors and his government um, to raise the funds needed. It was a very, very, very heavy ransom, a very expensive ransom. A lot of that was through taxing the churches and noblemen, which wasn't popular, but she, she managed, it took them six months, but she managed to raise um, the ransom money that they needed. And while she's doing all of this, her youngest son, John, and the king of France, who by this time was Louis VII's son, Philip II, they're both trying to get the throne away from Richard. So she's fighting off rebellions from both of them as well. Again, this is a woman in her 70s. This is, this is amazing. And she even wrote to the Pope. She wrote to the Pope um, to say, you know, I, I need help um, from, from the Pope. And in her letter, I love this. She said, um, Eleanor, this is how she signed herself, Eleanor, by the wrath of God, Queen of England. So this was not a woman to be messed with. So she ultimately negotiated Richard's release along with his, his government. She got him released. She got the, the ransom to release him. And she even went over to Germany to accompany her son back to England. So just to show you as an aside, um, many years ago now, I was actually in Austria um, and went down the Danube. I took a little boat ride to go down to Dernstein and another small town along the Danube. This is the, the remains of the castle where Richard was held when he was a captive in Austria. You can still hike up there today. You can see it up here on the hill in Dernstein. Okay, so. 1199, Richard dies without an heir, um, and therefore he has named John as his successor. And again, Eleanor was instrumental in making sure that John was his successor, not only in England, that, that he also maintained um, control over the territories uh, in France, because John had a potential rival in his nephew, Arthur, who was the Count of Brittany. Arthur was the son of John's older brother, Geoffrey, who had by this time had died. And for a short time when Richard and John weren't getting along, because none of these people got along for very long, for a short time, Richard said, I'm going to make Arthur my heir. But ultimately, he decided to make John his heir. But meanwhile, Arthur is like, oh, no, 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 I think I'm going to, you know, try to try to get the crown. Well, Eleanor made sure that um, John got the support he needed. Uh, she rallied support for him in Anjou and in Normandy, and she made sure that her son, John, was king instead of her grandson. She had some influence in John's uh, early reign. Uh, when he first became king, John and Eleanor together traveled throughout England, uh, and they were granting various privileges to churches and urban communities. They were negotiating with the regional aristocracy. But after that time, we do see a tailing off of Eleanor's influence, direct influence at court. Now that said, she still had one very important diplomatic mission left in her. I mentioned the travels that she, she did under Richard II, or Richard I. So when she was almost 80 years old, she undertook her last great diplomatic mission. And this time it was traveling to Castile to select one of her granddaughters, in this case, Blanche of Castile, um, as a bride for King Philip's heir, the future Louis VIII. So what they were trying to do is broker this peace between France and England, because there was always a problem between them. So this was a very important mission, and it was going to be a very, very, very important marriage. So they thought by marrying the English and the French, you know, we can kind of bring this back together, broker a peace. She chose well, she had a lot of granddaughters, but in choosing Blanche, she chose very well. It was, and you can see this uh, image on the right as Blanche and her husband being crowned king and queen at their joint um, coronation in France. Uh, turns out Blanche was quite a character herself. Uh, it was said that she had the attitude and aptitude for holding power just as her grandmother did. So she was cut from the same cloth as her grandmother. So she made a very, she brokered a very good deal there. In the same year that this happened, she helped um, defend Anjou and Aquitaine against Arthur of Brittany, her grandson, who was still trying to cause problems. Uh, and then in 1202, just two years before she died, again, she held off Arthur. By this time, he actually had her under siege. Um, John was off elsewhere fighting. John came back, that's when he, he was able to um, rescue her 
and finally capture Arthur, but she held off the sea. She, Arthur did not manage to, to get her. So although she had pretty much taken a step back from English politics at this point, her involvement in the Aquitaine never ceased. She was politically involved in the Aquitaine right up to the very end of her life. We know that as, as late as a year before she died, documents were still being issued in her name. And therefore it's very fitting that she spent her last years in Aquitaine. What are we doing for time? We're gonna go a bit over because we started a bit over. So I hope you can hang with me here. So um, Eleanor died around, like you said, we think she was around 82 years old on the 31st of March, 1204. She's buried in an abbey church in Anjou alongside her husband, um, who you can see here, her second husband, Henry II. And King Richard I is also buried uh, in, this, in this chapel. Now, this is what I was saying. This was the only really contemporary image we have of her. And as you can see, she looks a lot younger than 82. Um, but she, while, while Richard and Henry are holding um, symbols of power and symbols of kingship, Eleanor is, she has the crown on her head, but she's simply dressed and she's simply holding an open book in her hands. Now, I want to finish with one more tale about Eleanor's um, notoriety. And this was something called the Black Legend. I should say again that, you know, the reputation and personality of Eleanor has never been easy to assess. Um, contemporaries themselves were divided on whether they liked her or not in her opinions. And again, we had very few real contemporary resources to see who this real woman was. So again, like Anne Boleyn, a lot that we know comes from supposition and rumor, um, people writing much later, and then these rumors carry on and carry on and carry on. But certainly given the length of her life and her influence and her intellect and her power, not to mention her sex, it's not surprising that she both fascinated um, and elicited strong opinions from people who were writing about her. Again, Chroniclers would call her frivolous, flighty, unstable, sexually amoral. Uh, and these depictions are really unfair because all they're looking at is the scandalous side and the side that attached it. They're not looking at the, the actual power that she had and the influence that she wielded, particularly in her later years. Those aren't as interesting to talk about, I suppose. But out of all of this came what was called the Black Legend. Now I talked about some of these scandals earlier about the Crusades and about her supposedly starting the rebellion with her sons. This is one of the most enduring legends surrounding Eleanor. And this was supposedly her murderous jealousy of Henry II's mistress, Rosamond Clifford, also known as the Fair Rosamond. And the story has it that Eleanor murdered Rosamond uh, the first, initially, it was supposedly she murdered her, she stabbed her to death. And then later um, accounts say, well, she gave Rosamond the choice. She would stab her or she would let Rosamond drink a, a cup of poison. So what you see here, this was a pamphlet put out, I, I think, in the 1600s. Um, and here's Eleanor holding the sword. Looks like Rosamond has decided, OK, I'm going to go with the poison. And she's not looking too, <laughs> looking too good in that picture. Um, but this was something that carried on and on and on throughout time, um, this, this kind of rumor about this. In the 19th century, um, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote a verse about this, uh, about her murdering Rosamond. Uh, this is a 19th century ballad, a copy of a 19th century ballad, a lamentable ballad affair, Rosamond. So mentioned again. Uh, and even in The Lion in Winter, there's a reference to the fact that she was responsible for killing Rosamond. Now, we can say without a doubt in this case that Eleanor's um, killing of Rosamond is a total, total fabrication. We know that Rosamond entered a nunnery either in 1174 or 1176. We don't have the exact date for that, but we do have an exact date and records for the fact that, El that um, Rosamond died in the nunnery in 1176, Eleanor was still a prisoner at that time after the Great Revolt. So Eleanor had nothing to do with Rosamond's death. But the rumor persists right up until the 20th century. There are a couple of um, paintings, um, the Pre-Raphaelite paintings. The Pre-Raphaelites loved anything tragic and romantic. So this first rather disturbing one is from a, um, an artist named Evelyn de Morgan. 
and it's Queen Eleanor and Fair Rosamond. And you can see there are certain, here's Eleanor coming in. Henry built Rosamond a house in Oxfordshire. And rumor has it he made it into a maze so Eleanor couldn't find Rosamond. But one day Rosamond was spinning and a piece of her thread went out through the maze. And just by happenstance, Eleanor happened to be there and followed the thread and found Rosamond. So here's Eleanor holding the thread. She's surrounded, kind of hard to see, and is surrounded by serpents coming in the door with her. She's got monkeys, for heaven's sakes, you know, over her shoulder. And she's holding the little vial of poison. And here is poor Rosamond looking innocent and pure. She's got a little crown on her head to show that she was a concubine of Henry. And she's surrounded by little doves and cherubs. And up above, there's this stained glass window of these two lovers embracing. Uh, that was one image. The other one, this is even more saintly looking. This is Fair Rosamond by another pre-Raphaelite painter, um, John William Waterhouse. And in this one, we've got Rosamond on her knees as if in prayer with her hands clasped. She's dressed in this blue robe. She almost looks like the Virgin Mary, you know, almost like she's waiting for the Annunciation, the, the dove to come flying through the window, surrounded by flowers of innocence and her hands are clasped as, as in prayer, looking out the window, waiting for her lover and lurking behind the curtain here is the murderous Eleanor who is about to end her life. And you can even see, and just in the corner here, there's that spinning wheel that gave Rosamond away because the thread went out, went out the door. All right, so in closing, um, get my arrow down there. Eleanor has been misjudged by a lot of historians. Um, and certainly in the decades following her death, um, her image was really marred by these clerical chroniclers who viewed her with suspicion, who looked at her, um, you know, as, as a powerful woman, which they did not like. So that, that means she had to be bad. Um, a lot of them were writing during the time of uh, Henry II when he was thinking of divorcing her. But again, a lot of this um, narrative survives into the 20th century. At the same time, there was at least one biography that came out, or I think around 1999, um, that paints her as a feminist heroine and said, nobody was ever like this in history. No woman was ever like this in history. The truth is someplace in the middle. Um, I mean, it's true that she was a very powerful figure and a remarkable figure in many, many ways. But there were other women heiresses who held their own lands. Um, there were other women powerful queens. Uh, when, when Eleanor went on crusade, she was actually accompanied by the ruling queen of Jerusalem. So that wasn't even that unusual that women went on crusades. Uh, Eleanor's own cousin Petronella became the queen of Aragon and was pretty powerful in her own right. So like anything else, I think there's a balance in the middle here, but that said, um, certainly the power that she exerted, um, particularly in her son's reign, that was highly unusual. There were powerful mother figures. There were queen mothers. Uh, we see this even later with Henry VII and his mother but not quite to the extent um, I would say that Eleanor managed to, to and, and certainly throughout such a long life, that was the other thing, to have such a long life and have that kind of influence ebb and flow throughout those decades um, is really quite remarkable. The image, last image I'm leaving with you with here is a postage stamp from 2004, a French postage stamp commemorating the anniversary of Eleanor's death in 1204. So as you can see, she still is a fascinating character to people who she has not been forgotten, definitely was an undisputed key figure and influence during the reigns of um, the kings along whom side she is laid to rest in Aquitaine. So thank you very much. I'm sorry we went over a little bit. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen now. Can figure out how to do this. Ah. Where am I? Let's see, let me get out of here. Okay, does anyone have any questions, comments? We see one yeah. thing. Oh, that's okay, I, I was do. just, yep. I do, at first I wanna say that was just fabulous. Yes, oh, that was fabulous, thank you. Thank so you. I, I'm curious about the images that look very, you know, medieval. medieval, very 12th century, but you're saying they're not contemporary. Yeah, they like were a little said, later. They were, they but were so, but 
a hundred years, maybe? Um, it, some of them were probably done. Some of them may have been closer than that. They may have been 50 years, but yeah. 50 to 100 years. Yeah. yeah. And, and so the it's one, easy to see those and say, oh, look at that. It's medieval. It's got to be her. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially the one right after she marries Henry. I really mm -hmm. like she's giving this gesture. So yes. Like, oh, la di da, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you see the red hair and everything. Um, and, okay, and there could thank be, you. There could be, there could be a couple that are contemporary. Yeah. The problem is we do not have records stating that they are contemporary, right. so we can't be right. uh, automatically assured that they are. But certainly, a couple of them are very. They look within fifty years at the most. I would say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other. Yes. Oops, you're muted. You have to unmute. On one of our drives through the Loire Valley one year, we stopped at Chateau Chin Chinon. Chinon. Oh, yep, yep, Chinon, yep. And it is a spectacular place to visit. And apparently Eleanor spent a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. And was there, I mean, this was about 35 years ago. So I just remember gardens and I remember that she had set up a school for women. Yep, yep, yep. Which was quite unusual for that time and place. Yes. And yep. So if any of you <laughs> go to France, to the Loire Valley, do not miss she and mom because it's gorgeous and also are there what i i was surprised at you talking about women on the crusades were there large numbers of women or were they maybe 10 percent of the or yes. that were they the wives of people on the crusades yeah a lot of times um cuz the, the way the crusades really started out were you know the the pope would call for this holy war take up the cross and a lot of just um average people would just go rushing off to the crusades because they saw this as a salvation for their souls as well so as i said during the second crusade it was unusual because suddenly you had two kings leading the crusade which was not the case in the first one i don't know percentage wise I know it wasn't highly unusual to have women on the Crusades. Some of them were basically the camp followers who mm -hmm. went into the cooking and the tending to the wounded and, and what have you. But we do have evidence, as I said, you know, the Queen of Jerusalem accompanied Eleanor on the Second Crusade. And we there is evidence later of others, uh, other women taking a more, uh, they didn't take an active role in the sense that they weren't leading the fighting, they weren't making military decisions, but they did accompany their husbands um, in some cases. But yeah, I don't know. I know it wasn't unusual. I don't know what the percentage is. I can try to see if I can dig up some information on that. But, right. It would be a great novel. <laughs> yeah, it would definitely. And I, I would probably some somebody may have already written oh, it. That. Yeah, no, it would been. be. Um, yeah. And I should also say when you made the comment, one thing I didn't say, which is a good point, when you made the comment about the school for women, Eleanor um, in her in, in Aquitaine, um, she was also very influential in setting up a court that supported the arts and supported literacy and supported mm -hmm. music and poetry. And she, yes, that was another side of her that I didn't even really get into. But she, and she was known for the courtly love. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. As was her grandfather. Her grandfather yeah. was a troubadour, and yeah. So um, yeah, she supported a lot of that as well. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure you've read it, Deb, but I read it a long time ago, but there's, there's lots of novels, historical novels about around Eleanor, uh, at least where she's the main character and sometimes, you know, a secondary character. But um, I, again, I read it so long ago that it's hard for me to recommend it, you know, in it, you know, entirely, but I remember really liking it. And it's the Sharon K. Penman mm. um, novels and who writes about that time and actually writes beautifully about Richard III as well. But the one about um, Eleanor and Henry is called Time and Chance. And Penman is P-E-N-M-A-N. And in fact, you could buy a used one on Amazon for $1.25. So... <laughs> <laughs> 
And Alison Weir has one too, and she's a pretty good writer and, and historian. But so anyway. Um, if, and, if, and our local Jean Mackin, I just read that right. one and it's okay, I think. I forgot about. I that's forgot. right, she did a, an Eleanor one, right. Yeah, the Queen's yeah. War. Right. Yeah, 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 but yeah, it's, yeah. Most, it's mostly, it's a lot Rosamond and courtly love alleged love affair with mm -hmm. Poe. So there's a lot of a lot about that stuff, which I so don't understand. My goodness, that's a whole other discussion. I just don't. Huh? What were they so thinking? You know? I have a question, <laughs> if, uh, Deb, if, if, if there are any contemporary sources that elude or accuse or whatever the word would be, Richard of being gay. Um, oh, yeah. oh, that's a modern uh -huh. thing. That's been uh -huh. largely debunked at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, is largely? Yeah. yeah, it has largely been debunked at this point. It is again another, you know, it's complicated because um, the kings did have their favorites. Um, there were there were there were some rumors surrounding that, um, and again, they kind of carried down. But a lot of those, my understanding is. A lot of those were put out by Richard's enemies. Um, and if, if a male had a favorite, the same way if a female, the same way Eleanor yeah. closeting with her uncle Raymond had to be sex. Yeah. Right? If a male had a favorite, men can't be friends, you know, so it had to be sex. Uh, but that has largely been debunked at this point um, due to really any lack of evidence. I mean, there are certainly kings throughout history that we can point to and say, yeah, we have pretty good evidence that, you know. Well, yeah, one of them got off because of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, um, but no, there really isn't strong. Now, you know, and part of the rumor, part of the reason that rumor also arose is because um, when Richard I married, he and his wife never did have children. And there was, oh, there must be something going on there. And he has this, you know, these male friends and blah, blah, blah. So if they didn't have children, it must be because he's not sleeping with her and it must be because he's gay. You know, so again, it's this kind of supposition and rumor. The problem with this time period, even when you get into the Tudors, I mean, it's, it's the records are a little better in the Tudor period. Um, so much of it is supposition and so much yeah. of it is who is writing at the time. And often that's why I say time and time again, Look closely at the sources that they're quoting. See when these people were writing. See what conditions they were writing under. The chroniclers that largely smear Eleanor for her sexual exploits, anyway, um, are people that were writing 30 years after the fact, you know, and, and they were writing because Henry had a vested interest in maybe getting rid of his wife. So, um, and it's the same kind of way with some of these other rumors too. But once they hold, they hold. Because, you know, I think, as I said, with, with um, the, in the Anne Boleyn talk, sex and scandal sell. People love sex and scandal. So no, of course, no one's gonna talk about the fact that, you know, Eleanor was a, a very, well, I shouldn't say no one, but I mean, it's not as sexy to say, yeah, she was a powerful woman who was a regent in her own right. It should be, and today, and today, in the 21st century, that is more appealing to us, I think, as women anyway. But certainly when you're looking at the uh, 18th, 19th, even earlier 20th century, people are like, no, we want the juicy stuff. We want the juicy stuff. You know, and that's what holds. That, that's what kind of persists with people. So yeah, but no, there's no, I think it's pretty much largely been debunked now that Richard I was, was homosexual, was gay. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you so much, Deb. Oh, you're um, welcome. You're yeah. such a great job on these. And I yeah, yeah. And if if those of you who plan on tuning into Richard the Third, if you want to read this particular uh, novel uh, uh, before uh, this. Yes. What is uh, it? The yes. Daughter of Time. Yeah, yeah. Very good read. It, it is. is great. I'm reading it. Even if one it, is not, even if one's not particularly into uh, British history, it's still good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a new like it's, it's yeah. written in the what the late fifties or mid fifties, and and so it, it's this police detective who is laid up in the hospital and he's bored silly and he decides to really look into Richard the Third and whether he really was as bad as people said and you know he comes to the conclusion that he got a raw deal and uh, but anyway. Um, okay. 
So, so the pieces that take place in the 50s actually seem really dated. Okay. <laughs> but so, but, but, so are we. <laughs> what's that? So are we really. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Well, that, but, it's funny. It's funny because that was actually my introduction to Richard III. When I was in the hospital recovering from surgery, somebody gave uh, me that book. Wow. And I'm like, oh, wow. And it was, it was quite a engaging read. Um, this yes, it was my introduction to Richard the yeah. Third, and part yeah. my, it is, you know, piqued my interest in him as yeah, well. Decades and decades and decades ago. But I just thought, how how fitting. I'm laid up in the hospital um, for ten days, and now I'm reading this book about this guy in the hospital, and he's solving this mystery of Richard the Third. So and yeah, all you were doing was just lying there. Huh? I was lying there. I wasn't solving anything. I wasn't solving anything. Uh, but um, but yeah, so I will be doing um, another lecture next month on Richard III. So um, if you're interested, please tune in for that. Uh, so we're going to move away from notorious queens to a notorious king. That's Good. Be next month. In the meantime, um, any more questions? Okay. What was the uh, Dan, What was the if, if for any of you who tuned into the Anne Boleyn or interested in Anne Boleyn? What was the thing that you either sent me or I sent you about the, the about Heber being? Uh, I sent not, you the thing about Heber. Yeah, Heber not being correctly also, dated. Yes, not being correctly dated. Well, the see, and this is what I mean. This is what I find fascinating about history. But this is also what makes me. I would have been a very um, unsuccessful popular historian. Because in popular history, everybody has to take a stance, obviously. Yeah. And have it, have Richard, that angle. Richard was bad. This is a picture of Anne, or this isn't a picture of Anne. What makes me really, which is why I would never succeed at this, is I'm like, we don't know for sure. You'll hear me say that 120 times because I hate to say anything wrong. And I'm like, I'm sorry, we don't have the documentary evidence. I am not putting my hands there. So for Heber Castle, for those of you that came to the, the Anne Boleyn talk, it was believed for centuries that the great hall in Heber Castle, the, the great gallery in Heber Castle was built by Anne Boleyn's father, Thomas Boleyn, um, a very prominent um, architectural historian who I love, um, Simon, gosh, now I'm blanking on his last name. That's terrible. I've heard him speak a hundred times. I have all his books. He's fantastic and very, very, very good about making sure his sources are correct. Anyway, somehow he uncovered the fact that that great gallery, that great hall, that supposedly was built by um, Thomas Boleyn. And so, so there was this, you know, so Anne walked up and down this hallway, you know, when she was, um, it was- And actually, her ghost does. <laughs> and her ghost haunts it. It was actually built by um, Anne's successor, a couple successors later, Henry's fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, um, because mm. Henry divorced Anne of Cleves after only six months of marriage. Of all of Henry's six wives, Anne of Cleves probably came out the best in the bargain. They divorced after, yeah, they divorced after only six months. She happily divorced him. Um, she became known as the, the king's sister. He mm -hmm. gave her Heber Castle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she is the one, Simon, whose name, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting it. I can share it with, I can share it later if anyone wants Turley. to. Uh, Turley. Turley, thank you. Oh my God, thank you. Yes. Um, he He's the one that discovered that, no, actually Anne of Cleves built this. So it's, that's one of the things I love about history is because history is never finished being written. Mm -hmm. History is constantly, we're constantly discovering new things, but it's also the reason you will hear me say time and time again, truth is probably somewhere in the middle. We don't absolutely know for sure. I'm not gonna call this a picture of Eleanor, even though other people have said they think it's Eleanor because I want the verifiable proof in my hand. And that's just nine times out of 10, you're not gonna find it. <laughs> that many centuries ago. But yeah, that was very interesting, major breaking information, mm -hmm. particularly for early early modern historians. Like I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, something new. So we always learn something new. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to let everyone, I hope if you have not been out already, please go out and enjoy this glorious weather. And thank you again for sitting in here and listening to me rabbit on about the Middle Ages when it's so nice out. Um, and sorry about the, the kind of a long beginning there when we were trying to get things straightened oh. out. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. You thank do such you. a great job on these. I really oh. appreciate this. <laughs> well, I, I enjoy doing them and I'll try to see if I can find figures on uh, what percentage of women went to the Crusades. Not sure that's available, but I'll see what yeah, I can I find. Can <laughs> that would be okay. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.